Hey everyone, welcome to our first live video clinic here in the Balance Riding Course Workshop. I'm so glad for everyone that's jumping in here. It's awesome to see everyone um, coming in as we get started. So uh, you know me, I'm sure already if you're here, I'm Callie, founder of Horse Class, teacher of uh, the Balance Riding Course. And I'm here today with York. And York is our social media strategist, our community manager, and is going to be helping me to host this live clinic. So thank you, York, for coming in here. Thanks for having uh, me today, Callie. Absolutely. So what I want to get started with, this is always an easy way to just for us to make sure that the um, the tech is working, that you can hear me, that you can um, see us okay. If you could just leave a comment in the chat and let us know where in the world you are tuning in from. Um, and New York, where are you tuning in from? I'm tuning in from Colorado in the United States. And I am actually, I don't know how many of you um, know this, I haven't posted it a lot, but I am actually coming to you from Mexico. So I have been down here training endurance horses for most of this year. I've been back and forth to the farm in Pennsylvania, a lot of it for the filming for the balance riding course. Um, but I am back here in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico right now. So that's where I'm coming to you from. We, we truly are an international group today. Okay, and we are gonna also be streaming this to Facebook, uh, to a Facebook Live page for everyone that's joining in there. And York, I'm actually wondering if you're seeing the Facebook share from your end, because it seems to be hidden on my side. I'm not seeing it, Callie. Okay, well, maybe we will just be posting the recording for everyone on Facebook. So the agenda for today is I want to start out with, um, with, a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of what to expect through this workshop. And then what I'm gonna be doing next is um, sharing, sharing a big lesson that I learned. My, my last few years have been a little different. You know, I already mentioned that I'm, I'm down here. I'm working with horses down here in Mexico. Before I was working with horses in uh, California last year with Mustangs. And that was truly a transformative year for me in terms of, um, in terms of my horsemanship, really, and there's a lot of lessons that came from the work that I was doing with the Mustangs that inspired me to want to recreate the balanced riding course and to recreate this training for you. Because even through that period where I wasn't doing a ton of riding, it did so much for my riding. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, then we have four videos to look at today from participants here of the workshop that sent in their videos for coaching. Um, for feedback on the live clinic today. And then we're going to be taking any questions. York is going to be helping to um, see your questions as they come in, um, to relay them to me. We'll get through as many as we can. We're going to be here together for an hour today. Um, but we're also going to be doing this on Thursday, October 14th, as well as Saturday, October 16th, same place, same time. Um, so again, thank you. I love seeing all of the messages that are coming in from people everywhere in the world. This is awesome. So to kind of kick off with our housekeeping, I'll start with some of the best practices for today's call. And one of these is actually for how you leave your comments so that we can we can best kind of have this whole energy of the group and you can see everyone else's comments and they can see yours is when you submit a comment, there's a little drop down there and it gives you several options and you want to um, send your comment or send your chat to everyone. So make sure the little everyone is ticked and that way everyone can see it, not just us. Also, as we get into this and you have questions, you'll see on the bottom that there's a little um, Q&A Q &A icon. Put your questions in that section, in the little Q&A. And with your questions there, it's easier for York to be able to see those, to be able to track those and relay them to me. Um, it, York is also, we're super grateful to have her here to help with if you have questions about, hey, where's this in the workshop or when is this coming up? You can also put those in the Q&A. Um, she'll be doing her best through the call to relay those links or as I mentioned things that are already available for you to put those links out. Um, I think we're about ready to get 
started. Anything else that you can think of, York, for our call today? I think we're all ready to go. Okay, very good. So as I mentioned, the first thing that I want to start with is it the, the number one lesson that I learned working with the Mustangs. And to give you a little bit more background on what took me to this work, it's something that I've always been really, really excited to do. I've always wanted to work with Mustangs because I've always seen Mustangs as um, a really pure essence of the horse. And there's so many things that were taught about horse behavior and how horses interact with each other and then how we should interact with them. And I always thought what I would love to see the horses without the human contact, you know, just really see horses in their, I don't know, in more of a pure form, I'll say, in natural social groups and how they behave and how they interact without the intervention. So it's always been a um, a, a goal of mine, really, on one of my bucket list things to go into work with Mustangs. But also, I was at a point in my training that I was starting to feel, to be really honest, I was starting to feel a little bit stale. Being a trainer who has always specialized in behavior problems, sometimes it got kind of frustrating and a little demoralizing to have so many problems coming in, where to me, it was really that the horses needed to be more emotionally healthy. And I wanted to experience something different. I wanted to see what I could do different in, um, in my training. And also I have always most enjoyed being able to just be with the horse. For me, that part of just being with horses and working through, um, you know, teaching them something, exploring what we can do together, how that communication can happen, that's always been directly more important to me than even the riding. So that's what really inspired me to move from my farm in Pennsylvania, which is still our farm campus for horse class. We still have many clinics and events there throughout the year. We have two great trainers and instructors there, um, actually a few new instructors that just started. It's a, a vibrant community there, but that's what inspired me to move actually away from that that I had built for 10 years, along with building our online community and go out to California to work with um, the Mustangs of the Return to Freedom Sanctuary. So when I was working with horses out at the sanctuary, mostly what I was doing, there were kind of two parts to it. So some were was preparing horses for adoption, but just basic skills. So a lot of these horses going out, their riding training would come later. For many of them, actually, they weren't even going to be ridden, but they were going places where they needed to have the skills of being comfortable around people, wearing a halter, being led, having their feet trimmed, having basic vet care, that all of that could be done without you know, needing a chute system or needing to tranquilize them to do those kind of basic procedures. So I was doing that. It was preparing the horses for adoption. And then I was also working with some of the horses that had something happen that they had to be brought in off of the range. So this sanctuary has um, it, some really incredible spaces not only at their home base, but then also several other ranches that the horses are able to roam. Um, some of these places have up to um, 2,000 acres where the horses are out on. It's, it's incredible. But if a horse gets injured out there, you know, nature's way is they would probably die. At the sanctuary, depending on the injury, the horses are supported. They're brought back to that home location. And then my role then was taking this wild horse that now suddenly needs vet care um, and helping to facilitate that, that then they could have that vet care without it being super stressful. Um, so in, incredible experience. And even though I'm not living there anymore, I'm still back there very frequently and super involved with um, the sanctuary. So all that to just give you a little bit of context in, uh, I learned so many lessons. And last year, I really didn't even spend that much time riding because I was doing these other things with the horses and just completely focused on that. But I found that as I came back to doing quite a bit of riding this year, my riding had, had so improved because of the lessons that I learned and the, the internal lessons. And the number one thing that I learned from the Mustangs was to, to pay attention to pay attention to myself, to my internal state, to pay attention to my surroundings, to the environment, and to the horse that I was with. 
and sometimes the other horses that were around as part of that environment. And I know this sounds so simple, but to me, this is, this is a practice that we can just continue and continue and constantly get better at, constantly improve at. You know, one of these things that is just a life practice without, probably without ever truly mastering it. Um, I found that working with the wild horses, they had less desensitization to all of the human stuff. Meaning a lot of our horses that we work with in our barns and on our farms, they, even the most sensitive ones, can sometimes still have a level of they're kind of gotten used to human stuff. They've gotten used to overlooking a certain level of when humans just act goofy. You know, when we come in and we're distracted, and we're not really paying attention and we're doing other things and uh, we're busy in our mind, we're thinking so much about our posture riding that we're not really connected. The domestic horses get used to that. They kind of give us a little bit of a buffer in a sense, uh, which I'm so grateful for, especially the really great school horses give us an even bigger buffer. But with the, with the wild horses, there was a lot less of this. And it made me so keenly aware of not trying to hide at all the state that I was in and what I was feeling. So it, I needed to learn more strategies for changing my internal state, for being really authentic in what I was feeling, and then strategies for changing it instead of trying to hide it. And this is something that we're going to talk a little bit more about in part three of the workshop, because it's one of the, the three big myths of riding, is this idea of that we always just need to push through our fear, you know, like fake it till you make it, um, climb back on the horse, and it, there is, as I keep saying, there's a little element because we do have to, we do have to sometimes say, you know, okay, I'm going to push myself, I'm going to push my level of skill, and I'm going to, I'm going to challenge my comfort zone. But if we do it too much, and we do it all the time, and we're really scared inside, and we're just trying to kind of put on this front, and the horses pick up on it. And our domestic horses pick up on it, I think, just as much. It's just that they've become a little bit more accustomed to it, where the Mustangs would depending on how I came into that, um, that pen or that field with them, they could be completely different. And I learned to really just pay attention to, to myself, to the environment, to the horse simultaneously. And I wanted to lead our, really kind of lead our workshop and especially our, our live time here together with this, because I feel like this is so important, especially in the first part of the workshop, we were talking about position and we were talking about techniques and throughout the workshop, throughout even our call today, as we go into these um, feedback for the riders that are being featured here, I'm gonna go into techniques. You know, try this with your leg, um, you know, try doing this with your hand. And those techniques, those skills are super important, but equally important is our awareness of how we feel internally, listening to that. And when we can listen to that first, we can have a, um, we can have more awareness of the horse as well and of the other things that are potentially impacting our ride, our time with the horse. So I would love to, before we move into the videos, I would love if you could leave a comment and just let me know one practice that you have to kind of adjust the way that you feel. So if you're riding and you notice that you're tense or if you had a really, tough day at work and now you're going to the barn, what is a, a technique, a strategy that you have um, to kind of shift states before you go into riding? Or even the times that we're riding and we're trying something new, you know, maybe you take some of the exercises that we already went through in the first part of the workshop and you go out and you think this is not as easy as it looked in the video <laughs> and you start to get frustrated, uh, but what is the technique that you might use to be able to just kind of shift that and come back into, um, into being, a, so I, I introduced this as well in, uh, in the balance riding course in one of the videos. I love, love this quote from Linda Tellington Jones, incredible horsewoman. I'm sure most of you on the call know Linda. And she said that we want to be the person that my horse wants to be with. And that just to me rings so true and probably encapsulates what I'm trying to communicate here in um, what the Mustangs taught me as well this past year. So I can't wait to see your comments. I'm going to just scroll down here. Love this. Laura said a few minutes to practice mindfulness and deep breathing. 
Yeah, lots of breathing. And I love this one, trying to honor my fear when others are always saying, show them you're dominant, don't let them know you're afraid. I love that. And it's actually one of the things with emotions in general, I think this is true for our horses too, but just speaking to it within ourselves, when we can acknowledge the emotions there that is there and actually feel it, we move through it so much easier than if we try to just push it down and say, ah, I'm not afraid. Or when we say things like, you know, this fear is silly, or even with our horses, when we say, you know, he's he's been on the trailer 10 times already. He should not be afraid of it. When we can just say, oh, well, he might have been on it 10 times, but right now he's showing me all the signs that he's afraid. And we go with that in the same way that we can do that for ourselves of, yeah, it's true. Maybe you did jump that cross rail already three times today, but right now you're feeling a little afraid to do it. Honor that fear, feel it and let it move through instead of just trying to, trying to squash it. Thank you, Anne, such an important message. Focus on the moment. Singing, I love that one. That yes, that does, singing does help with proper breathing. It just helps to loosen everything. And that's, that's one of the themes in the first part of the workshop was, um, was breathing. Because breathing can just change so much in our body, in our seat, um, but it also changes our, our mental and emotional state as well. Josephine, I used grooming and tack up time to shift gears, just breathing in the smell of smell of the horse and clear my head. Uh, Robin, a specific, this is a, a good, a good breathing exercise is to breathe in, hold for, breathe in for four, hold for four, and out for six. So that, you know, having a, a specific regulation for the breathing. Joe said, I found laughter to be a huge aid in adjusting my own attitude. Laugh at my own mistakes, laugh at my own insecurities, laugh at my horse's mistakes. Yeah, totally lightens the mood. And it's, you know, it's also one of the things where we're here with horses and we're here riding because we love to be with horses. And, you know, if you think back to a moment when you started or a moment when you knew, you know, horses are gonna be a part of my life, the joy that was in that moment. And when we can keep connecting back to that, that's why we're doing this. And that's why we challenge ourselves to go through um, the tough times when it feels like we're just not getting better, um, the times that we have accidents, um, and the times that we you know, have to make those, those difficult decisions on, is this the right horse for me? What do I do next? Do I find a trainer? You know, Just all of those things that come with this journey, when we can come back to, this is why I ride, and we have some videos actually that are going to be coming up on that. Um, but it's such a it's such an important question. You know, why do you ride? Keep going back to that feeling. Okay, amazing comments in here. Keep them coming. Um, we're going to jump into the videos next. So just give me a moment here to pull up the video, and then I also want to say too, as you are, um, as I'm going through this video feedback please feel free to ask questions on the videos and I'll pause after each one to answer any questions about that specific video. And I don't know right now, we've got a, a long list of participants here, but um, I'm hoping that our riders who, who uh, sent in these videos are able to, uh, to be here as well. But we're also recording this. So you know, if you need to jump out early, if anything comes up, if you lose connection, no worries. It'll all be up for you later today. So the first video that I'm gonna start with is, Bonnie's video. So just bear with me a moment here as I get Zoom all set up to bring this up. All right, so just give me a quick uh, like, yep, I see it if you, it's not playing yet, but if you see the video here. Okay, cool, looks like we're good. 
Okay, so this video was sent in by Bonnie, and that Bonnie asked for some feedback and some help on um, riding riding the trot. So I'm going to go ahead and play it here because it's a, it's a short one; it's a minute long. Slower, Bonnie. Sit on those seat bones, half halt. A minute. Let me just turn the sound down so we can talk over it. Okay. There we go. All right, now I'm going to play it. So as you're watching this, I just want you to first, it's always helpful watching videos to um, see what you notice, see things that you can relate to. A lot of times the, the things that I'll point out in these videos, there's often like one or two things that when corrected can help with all of the writing, like can help to go through many of the other problems and challenges as well. And that's always what I look for when I do the video coaching, we do video coaching, throughout the balanced writing course too. It's like, what's that one thing that I can give you to help solve the first, the, the core of the problem. And then we can just start to build on exercises from there. That's also how I lay out the, the courses and the exercises that we are doing together. Because in teaching, I mean, thousands of writers in my, um, almost 15 years now as an instructor, there's definitely a pattern to the, the uh, things that I see. And in these videos too, that's why I wanted to bring these in because I feel like as I give some feedback here, you'll probably be able to relate to a lot of this feedback. So one thing that I just wanna mention, and I feel like we've got an awesome group here. I probably hardly need to say this, but just to, just to put it out, is it please be kind so we are all here together to learn, to improve. We all have things that we can improve on. Whenever I watch my videos, trust me, I'm always looking at things and saying, well, I could have done that better. I could have had better timing there. I dropped my hand here. So there's always things that we can improve on. And uh, many of you I know have also submitted videos that may be featured in, um, in upcoming, upcoming live clinics. So we're all here to learn does not matter what level someone is at, what level you're at, we're all here to improve. So kind, everything's about positive and improving. All right, so Bonnie, what I, the, the first thing, this is a very, very common um, position that we get into. And it's sometimes caused by a few different things. One, it's caused by um, pressure on the stirrups because we're taught so often to put heels down. And this is what I brought up in one of those common positions in the first part of the workshop as well, is this kind of chair seat look where we push on the stirrups and by trying to push our heels down, we end up swinging the stirrup forward, which then makes us more unstable. The other thing that can contribute to this um, kind of more chair seat with the leg out in front is the fit of the saddle. So we always have to look at the fit of the saddle. We can override our tack, meaning we can still find alignment regardless of the tack, but it's gonna be more difficult. And it's just worth saying because sometimes, excuse me, when you're struggling, 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 if you know, ah, it's because my saddle does not fit me. It doesn't even necessarily mean it's not a good saddle, but if it doesn't fit us, it's not gonna support that good position. So um, here, the first thing that I would, would recommend here for Bonnie is to bring your lower leg further back. So I'm just gonna kind of move, drag this back a little bit here. So what happens when our lower leg goes out in front like this is we end up having to be more tense to bring our upper body forward and we end up being more um, tight with our hands in order to keep that balance. One of the reasons for this is our, our nervous system is naturally going to make sure that it keeps our head over our like centered over us. So it, we're gonna adjust ourselves to make sure that generally our head is over our feet. And you can see that kind of happening here as, as the feet go forward, our head also comes forward and that kind of results in this position of then feeling like we've just gotta be tight because the feet are forward, the head, are, the head is forward and everything then becomes more tense. And then we can't use our rain aids as well. It also starts to lock our hip 
Our hip joint is such an important um, joint for riding. When that gets locked, it changes the way that our the way that we can um, move with the horse. So what I would recommend here for Bonnie, and we're gonna actually have a demo of this with a rider in um, part three of the workshop coming out on Friday. But what I would recommend is practicing first with your foot out of the stirrup, bringing your leg back and thinking about reaching down and back with your heel. So down is in relation to, um, we can allow our heel to drop as much as our flexibility and as our body will allow. So if we're trying to force our heel down and we're trying to push and get it as low as possible, that's when this swing forward starts to happen. But if we think about just lengthening the back of our leg, and that sometimes for some riders means that with the leg back, the leg is gonna be, or your foot is gonna be parallel to the ground or your heel is even gonna be a little bit lifted but it's the lengthening of the muscles on the back of the leg that are important. It's also thinking about bringing the leg back from the hip joint. You can see my cursor on the video right here where our hip joint is. So it's bringing your thigh back and your lower leg back instead of just trying to pick up the lower leg. And that's why, again, I said it's so important to think about the heel going down and back instead of just trying to pull this lower leg back. There's a little distinction there. And again, I'll do a demo for, for this in... Um, video three, because this is such a common and important um, function of our riding. So this is going to be the first thing here for Bonnie that's going to make a huge difference. And this is an example of when we, when we want to improve too, we want to focus on one thing at a time. We try to do too much. If we say, okay, do this with your leg, and now do this with your back, and now do this with your hands, and now do this with your upper body, it's difficult to do any of that because we're trying to suddenly juggle and do all these new things all at once. When we can see, okay, here is one of the, um, the kind of key points, change this, it's gonna allow, once the leg is back, now your head can come back, your upper body can come back, you can find that alignment, your hands will naturally become softer because you're gonna be more balanced. Um, your hands, then you're not going to have to rely on your hands or the gripping the reins for that sensation of balance. The steering will improve, et cetera. And then we can add kind of other exercises to help to finesse and to add more to those other layers. Okay, any questions here about Bonnie's video about this first discussion? Kelly, do you think you're able to show that again with the cursor? It seems like some people couldn't see the cursor on your screen. Yes, let me bring it up again. So actually I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do this a little different way because when I was showing the cursor, I was showing where your hip joint is. And we can actually go through a little exercise to just find your hip joint here. So uh, I want you to start with, and if you're in Wendy Murdoch's classes, you're not allowed to cheat. I want you to start with, um, put your hand where you think your hip joint is on your own body. Sitting, standing, doesn't matter. Actually, it's a little better if you stand up. So you might wanna stand up for the next next part of this exercise. Okay, so now with your hand there, I want you to just kind of bring your foot up on your toe and just rotate your knee a little bit in and out. And just notice the sensation of where that movement is happening. And now with your hand still where you thought of as your hip joint, is the movement happening in that place or is it happening somewhere different? So go ahead and put in the chat. Did you have your hand where the movement is happening or are you noticing that maybe the, the movement's happening somewhere a little different? Ah, Bettina said happening lower than I thought. Lower, lower, super common. We tend to think of the top of our pelvis as our hips. And then that creates this confusion because the actual hips, hip joint, that big ball and socket of where our femur comes into our pelvis is lower. So here's a little, a little trick to kind of find this, um, this joint. Follow the crease of your pants up on the outside of your pant leg. And you're gonna bring it up until you feel not all the way up into where you feel your pelvis, but just bring it up until you feel kind of a little bony section there. And then you're gonna run your hand in about halfway of your, halfway along your thigh. 
kind of right into that crease with, again, if you have your, your foot up on your toes and you're just kind of moving your knee in and out a little bit, and then just lightly move your finger there in that crease that's created on the inside of your, your leg, that's where your hip joint is. So when I say bring your leg back from the hip joint, that's what I mean is bring it back from this joint. So your pelvis stays stable, your lower leg comes back instead of now, if you were to just pick up your heel, like just lift your heel, notice how that tends to tighten your calf muscles and tighten um, the back of your thigh versus if you just move your leg back from your hip joint, those muscles can lengthen. And again, we'll have a demo of this in video three so you can see walking through this exercise um, with a horse and rider. All right, we're gonna jump back into questions, or I'm sorry, into the next video. So the next one that I wanna show, just give me a minute again to bring this up. This is um, it, Jennifer's video, and this is perfect because we were just talking about hips. And Jennifer's question when she sent this video in, what she wanted feedback on was how can I improve the movement of my hips for riding the canter? So the one thing that I have to apologize for on this video is unfortunately it's gonna be, it might be just a little bit um, glitchy in the playback. So I didn't realize we, I tested this, I tested playing the videos, but when I actually went to play them in Zoom, with a specific setting that allows them to play more smoothly. Um, the, these, some of these file formats that came in it just weren't playing well. So just one of those last minute tech things that, that came in. So this might be a little glitchy, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and play it here for you anyway. And then I'm just gonna pause it at a few points where we'll be able to just see the image together on the screen and talk through what I would recommend. So what's happening here at the canner, if you can see it in the little, the little moments that come through, is when we get, when we lock our hip and when the movement for the canner becomes our whole body. So think of this as, okay, here's upper body, here's legs. When our movement for the canner kind of becomes like this, it becomes, um, we're less with the horse. We are less able to, um, ask the horse to really squat and sit for some more advanced work, but it also makes it more difficult riding some bigger moving horses. And depending on how much forward we're coming, we can be a little bit of out of balance. We can be a little ahead of the horse's motion. So I wanna be really clear here that there's nothing wrong with riding in a forward seat. So when we're riding around a jump course, when we are galloping through a field, when we're going up a hill, we ride in a forward seat. We bring the angle of our upper body forward, but we also need to be able to bring that angle back and to have the movement happen through our, our hips, through our hip joints, that joint that we just found. So I'm gonna play this again. Again, apologies if it's playing a little bit glitchy, but here, if you kind of watch my hands too. So what happens when the movement of the canner, oftentimes when we're just a little too tight through our hip joints is it becomes this kind of movement through our body because our hip joints aren't moving. So it's just the body coming more forward, where instead, if we can bring the body slightly back and then the movement becomes more like this. See how now there's a slight opening here at my hip joint. Okay, so that's the concept of what we're trying to find. Let me find a moment here just to uh, pause the video so we can look at a good screen cap kind of paused moment together. So we can see here with Jennifer, Jennifer has a lovely alignment with her lower leg being back, but as a result of hips being a bit too tight is I think as your, your hips soften and you're better able to just follow the movement really independently with your hips, Jennifer, you're gonna find that your rein contact is going to be much more adjustable. And what I mean by adjustable is that our communication through the reins is is so important to be able to have pressure and then to release that pressure, even if it's just softening that pressure a little bit. Sometimes we still have contact, but it's pressure softening the contact because that is our communication with the horse of pressure is do something different. Release is that was right. 
when we start talking about the riding concepts like we do in module five of the course of helping the horse have a better frame, having them go more round, having them work through their back, it's a lot of this very subtle pressure and release that helps to guide the horse into that movement and helps to even support them in that movement as they're building their self-carriage. So this is another reason why finding this, this freedom through the hip joints, this fluidity is a better word, this fluid movement through the hip joints is so important, is because it helps our rein contact. I mentioned um, Wendy Murdoch earlier when we did that hip joint exercise, because that exercise is one that I learned from Wendy. And uh, Wendy also says that contact comes from a rider's hips. So good contact is much less about what we're doing with our hands and much more about what we're doing with our hips. Okay, so the exercise that I recommend for this, this one also is gonna be demoed in video three of our workshop. The exercise that really helps with this is taking the reins in one hand, if you're riding an arena in your outside hand, put your other hand on the back of the saddle. And you wanna put it on the back of the saddle that like your thumb is up, and your palm down on the back of the saddle. The reason for this is it allows your shoulder to rest more comfortably down and back. With your hand on the back of the saddle, you can put a little pressure there to open your hips as you are um, riding. And this is a great exercise for riding trot, rising trot, as well as canter. Because with your hand there, it creates a bit of a restriction in that you've got to keep your hand on the back of the saddle so you can't come forward with your upper body. Plus with your weight there, then you can start to feel how that cantering rolling movement of the horse opens your hips with each stride. So then again, instead of having this movement at the canter, we have more of this movement at the canter. And of course, everything comes in stages. Sometimes we're um, you know, very far forward in terms of our forward fold, say if we're galloping across a field, and then there's gonna be less of this kind of a mo motion. Sometimes we're riding a, a uh, higher level dressage movement with a horse that's really squatting and collected. And then we might be really upright and you see the canters really coming with the opening of the hips. So in riding, in posture, it's never static. And that's why I'll, I talk about too, this idea that we wanna have a functional posture instead of just static position and trying to find, okay, does this look right? Is this where I'm supposed to be? Because it's about feeling the motion, feeling the movement, that's really the key. Okay. Any questions here about Jennifer's video? We have a couple of clarification questions about types of saddles. Um, Patty asked, does that position of the legs change with Western versus English? And Marit asks, is it true that most saddles are made by men to men? Women and men have different physiology, thinking about the hips. Awesome questions. Um, it, so to the first, the first one about types of saddles, there are... There are many different types. Um, it, depending on the activity, the saddle does set us up to have a position that is better for that activity. So a clear example of that is in English saddles, a dressage saddle is meant to put the rider in a very upright frame with a really long leg. The alignment of the leg is still the same, but the actual position of the rider is going to be different. It's pretty tough to ride a jump course in a dressage saddle because you can't get your legs short enough. And if you come with enough of a forward angle in your body, that higher canto on the dressage saddle will often then be basically hitting you in the butt where your hips should be coming back for the jump. So where a close contact, a jumping saddle will then be flatter, lower canto, more forward um, flap, and also more forward stirrup bar that we still have that alignment of head over feet in both cases, like I mentioned in the last video, um, but our center and our center actually is still within that alignment. So it's like head, head uh, center, or I'm sorry, our, our center, center of gravity. Our center of gravity depends on where our weight is. So our weight is still balanced over our feet in both positions, but in that jumping saddle, we're gonna have more of a forward angle, hips farther back, that's how the center of gravity still stays over our feet. Um, so it does, it does vary a lot. And that's where too, looking for a saddle that, that fits you um, is important. It can do a lot for your riding, but there are things that we can do to learn to still find best posture possible. Um, trust me, I know from riding, from running a school barn, 
as much as we have a variety of saddles, you know, with 50 different riders coming in, sometimes in the course of a week, um, you know, up to 15 horses, it's like a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, trying to get the saddles to work well. So we always have to work within what we have, you know, and what we can, what the best that we can do. It's not about finding perfect, perfect, um, but when we're aware of how these things affect us, we can do a better job of um, doing the best we can in that context. The second question in terms of how are saddles made for men or women, also a great question. Um, the, there is a, a theory out there that a lot of the saddles have been made more for men, um, in, especially in some styles. And I have a feeling there probably is a lot of truth to that. Really, there is so much difference, you know, even difference within men, difference within women, in terms of our bodies, the size of our pelvis, how our leg hangs, um, the shape of our thighs, so many different factors that, that go into saddle fit. In fact, we have a little mini course that gets included as one of the bonuses um, that's with the balance riding course on saddle fit, where we go over what the waist and the twist and the seat and the cantle um, for English for Western, just so you can understand a little bit more what to look for. Thank you for those questions. Okay, we got two more videos to go through. So I'm gonna pull up the next one. Our next one is from Samantha. Kelly, before you start that video, the Sewing Equestrian asked a clarification question about that exercise. Sure. She asked, so practice rising trot with one hand on the cantle of the saddle. Maybe just cover that again of what the position is in the trot to practice to open your hip. Yes, one hand on the back of the saddle, thumb up so that your shoulder lays down and allowing your weight to basically rest back on that hand. And there'll be a demo of that on um, in uh, video three as well. So you can see it, see it in action. Okay, so our next video is with Samantha. And Samantha sent in this video asking for um, feedback on anything. Um, she said that this is the first that she's getting um, professional feedback on her riding. So I am thrilled to pull this video in. And I wanted to bring it in here to actually sh demonstrate several things here in Samantha's video. And it's, uh, oh, here's a bonus. It's playing in slow motion for us. Not even intended, but it's gonna work well. So I want you to actually watch here and Samantha is demonstrating a beautiful um, leg position for this saddle, for how she's riding here in that when she gets a little closer, in fact, I'm gonna just kind of move the video up to the part where she is a little bit closer. So see, even here at the canter, I'm gonna pause it when she's close right here. I want you to notice she's really, really doing an excellent job of demonstrating this idea of reaching down and back with her heel. So we can see that her thigh is on the horse and her heel is reaching down and back. Her muscles are lengthening along the back of her leg and her heel actually isn't down, down, meaning it's not even below the line of the stirrup, but she's got a really functional posture here. Um, she is bringing the stirrup a little bit angled back, which tells me that here she's overriding her tack a little bit, that she's having to pull the stirrup even a, a bit further back. Um, and this is such a great demo of when we ride to our body, instead of trying to force a look of my heels got to be lower, but when we ride to our body and our amount of flexibility, we can be super secure, even if we're not within that correct look. And it, Samantha's actually even showing more of this idea of the hips opening. So if you notice here how there's a bit more of this kind of motion in the canner, this video is slowing at just like the right moment. So it, this is a really great, a really great demo for those two things coming off of the, the last two that we just watched. What I would recommend here for you, Samantha, is that this horse looks like a lovely horse. You have a lovely Dalmatian as well. And uh, I would, I think this horse is going to be a, he's already a, a, you know, moving fluidly, moving with rhythm. 
but he's going to be able to have even a much better movement if you allow more lengthening of the, le the neck and encourage more forward movement. I'm actually going to go back here to where you were picking up the trot to kind of talk about this a bit more. So what I would recommend is also actually doing some exercises first where you are riding with one hand. We do a lot of these exercises um, whenever I'm working because I just think it's so important to really develop that balance independent of the reins. So one hand on the rein, one hand can be on your head, it can be out to the side, it can be reaching back like this with your, your palm facing up to open the shoulder, back of the hand on your back, all these different positions um, to really feel very comfortable riding with a loose rein. And then I would encourage with this horse a bit more forward movement and um, allowing that forward movement with a longer rein. And I think you might see him really start to reach more with his neck in trot and in canter, which is going to just make what you already have here in terms of you've got a solid position for riding bigger movement. And now if you allow that bigger movement from your horse, I think you're gonna be a, a super lovely pair. Okay, any questions here on Samantha's video? Holly asks, uh, hi Callie, for someone who isn't flexible through the ankle, but working on it through yoga, is a foot parallel to the ground an acceptable, helpful position as long as I have ear, shoulder, hip, ankle alignment? Yes, it, it absolutely is. And this is actually one of the things, so, you know, centered riding by Sally Swift, um, to me is like a Bible of good riding. And um, in that book, Sally gives the visual of imagining that you were on skis going through the sand so that your foot actually is parallel to the ground. And if you drop your toe, you're gonna to grab a toe and you're gonna tip forward. Same thing happens in the saddle. When our toes go down and our heels come up, we, all, we get unstable. It's not that we wanna have heels up, but if we push our heels too far down, then you're gonna feel like you're falling backwards if you were skiing in the sand. So that visual of skiing in the sand is, um, is uh, super helpful. And I just saw the, um, Samantha, so glad that you were here to see your, vi your video and your feedback. Thank you for sending it in. Um, also, Joy um, complimented Samantha, what a great horse, rider and horse. And um, I lost the comment here, but ah, who is self-taught. So I actually wanna highlight these because this is something that I've noticed when I work with a lot of riders that are self-taught. Um, there's something that happens to us when we start to go too much for a specific look. When we start to think too much about, oh, I gotta keep my hands here and I gotta put my leg here and I'm supposed to look like this and does this look okay? Am I doing it right? That we can get in our own way with all of those thoughts. And I found that actually with a lot of riders that are mostly self-taught, there's a level of sometimes fluidity and relaxation there that, you know, sure, there's always things we can improve, um, but when there's less of a, what do I need to look like and less of that external instruction always coming in, it can actually be really beneficial. So it's one of the things that I think is, is super helpful for online courses and how I really strive to teach the online course is to give demos, to give you visuals, but to really give exercises because the important part is for you to feel these concepts within your own body and and having that, in, that internal feeling is just super important because we are all so individual. You know, what, what is the right look for one rider is gonna be different for someone else. So we've got to ride to our own, um, our own best alignment, our own functional posture. All right. Excellent. And then Laura asks, I was taught by several instructors to hold a half seat or two point to help realign my leg back. Can you comment? So here's, here's one of the things too that's really interesting with, um, with feedback from different instructors and what we have to take into context is there will be times when I am teaching in person and when I do this kind of video coaching within the course that you know what I tell one person of, okay, do, we're going to do this exercise to stabilize your leg might be completely appropriate for this rider 
it might not be the best exercise for this rider over here. So I would kind of take that with a, this is a, here's a litmus test to run it by. When you do an exercise, um, it, how does it feel? How does it feel in your body? And we have to remember that when we make a change, when we've been accustomed to something, we make a change, it can sometimes always feel a little weird at first because it feels different. Um, but once you get through that initial, oh, this feels a little different stage, it should feel better. And if it's feeling better, if you're feeling more stable and secure, and then great, continue with that exercise. If it's not, then reevaluate and say, is this the right exercise for me? Or do I, you know, am I not interpreting the instructions correctly? Great for, as you're trying the exercises, going through the workshop as well. Okay, so I wanna pull up our final video here from today. And this video is with Jetty and her gated horse. This is a super fun video. I love watching gated horses. And actually, I my first my first horse was Scotch. He was a quarter horse. And then I got Scotch when he was 32 years old. So I only had a few years of riding on Scotch, even though he lived to 37. Um, he retired around 35. It was incredible. But um, after Scotch, as Scotch was getting getting too old to do as much riding as my young self wanted to do, <laughs> um, I got Flame, who was a Rocky Mountain horse, and then we also got Ace. My dad was riding a little bit at the time, and Ace was my dad's horse, and uh, Ace was a Kentucky Mountain horse. So a lot of my early riding was on gated horses, and I have... Uh, I think they are so fun. Gated horses will always have a super special place in my heart. And you've seen Ace featured on a lot of videos. He's the little, um, the what they call it in the breed color is he is a red chocolate with flaxen mane and tail. Um, so basically he's a beautiful chestnut and he's a little guy. He's uh, 13, three. And now he's had surgery for a, a dental condition that we had to remove his incisors. So now if you see him in some videos, his little tongue hangs out, but he's, uh, that's how you can recognize Ace. If you see a horse with his tongue hanging out, it's Ace. Okay, so we're gonna watch Jetty's video here. Again, I apologize for this one. It's gonna be um, probably a little glitchy as well. This is another one that when I pulled in this file format, it didn't, it didn't play smooth, but um, I'm gonna pause it as well. So we can take a look right about here, okay. So Jetty wanted feedback on um, having some more confidence and building confidence riding and coming back from some, some physical ailments and how to kind of just feel better in the saddle coming back from that. And here's one of the things that I really believe about confidence is that there's two parts. There's the mental part of confidence, which is like building good experiences, finding the right part of our comfort zone, to be working in that we're pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves, but not going too far. Um, there's the strategies to, you know, find ways to come back into the present moment and to get rid of all those what if thoughts. We talked about some of those at the beginning of the call, but there is also the level of confidence that is, is improved by our skill. That, you know, when we are more secure, when we're more aligned and stable in the saddle, that we can simply just feel better. Because if we're kind of feeling like, oh, I might fall at any moment, and our nervous system is picking up on that lack of balance, it's going to trigger us to feel a level of anxiety, regardless of any good strategy that we have or any type of great, you know, mindset practices that we have. So both are equally important. So I have some, um, some Specific things here that I think is uh, is really going to help you, Jetty, with feeling more balanced and aligned. And you're going to notice this is the same regardless of being on a trotting horse, regardless of when we're looking at the canter videos, or here on your your little gated guy. So, the first thing I would recommend is we can see here. This goes back to hip joints. Um, so, I actually, want you to stand up again. Follow along in this one. Bring your foot back up where your toes are just kind of pointed on the ground, knees softly bent, and take your, your knees or your knee slightly out. Actually, you could do this one sitting and take both knees out as well. 
But as you do that, notice what happens to your hip joint. So your knee comes in, notice what it feels like there, your knee goes out. See if you can sense it as your knee goes out, the space in the back of your hip joint gets smaller. So in the course, I have this cool skeleton with little half femurs on it that we can actually see this in action. Um, but here, just notice that the, the space in the back of that joint is getting smaller as your hip goes out. Now, I would encourage you to actually do this the next time you're riding is take your knees out off of the saddle and notice the movement in your hips. Does it feel more restricted or more free? And then bring your thighs back on the saddle where the um, where your femurs are able to come more straight out of your hip joints. And this is another one of the functions of good saddle fit is allowing for this because when our leg, when we have our thigh on the saddle and we're of the inside of our thigh on the saddle and our hip joints are open in the back, and that comes from the knee being in, not squeezing in, big difference there, not squeezing in, but resting on the saddle because of this alignment of the leg that we talked about in the earlier videos and that we'll continue to revisit through this workshop. Then our hip joints are more free for any of the gates. So I would actually recommend the same exercise here for you, Jetty, of bring your heel out and back. And for you, the most important motion is gonna be thinking about the out. Because see, if I move it a little bit again, what happens when the toe goes out and we grip with more of the back of our calf is we end up restricting the back of our hip joints and then we can't move as well. So even with these gated guys that we're not doing a rising trot or you know, you're not doing a canter with this obvious movement, when, they're, when you're restricted, it still puts more tension in their movement, in their gait. When we're free in our hip joints, then we can use our back to half halt to say, oh, slow down a little bit or go more forward, even within that gait. But it comes from our back, not from restricting the movement through the back of the hip joint. So that's the first little thing that I would recommend here. And I'm going to give you a, even an extra little bonus because this is such a good reminder too of what we've been talking about in terms of this functional posture. Depending on arm length, we don't need to have our hand at the withers because if you've got a shorter arm in relation to your torso and to your horse's neck, if you try to keep your hands at the withers, you can end up being too straight through your elbow, which actually pulls your upper body down and also restricts the ability to move freely with good contact. So here, what I would recommend, Jetty, is actually letting your upper arm hang a bit more, which is going to let um, more bend come into your elbow. And that's actually going to raise your hand slightly, which is going to allow a straight line to come here from the bit back through to your elbow. This is going to give you a better contact and just a better feeling of relaxation there on the back of, um, on the, back of the horse. One other little tip, because you mentioned about side to side stability. And it's right here. So notice here as you came, this has happened to all of us where you're riding along and you kind of get a little unbalanced and then you got to push yourself back into that balance point. But what can, how you can maintain your balance, this is for anyone, if you find that you have, your body has a tendency to kind of drift one way, or if your instructor or you know someone watching consistently gives you feedback of, hey, you're leaning right or you're leaning left, is think about, from your pelvis being straight and level in the saddle. Because if we just move with our upper body, and sometimes we have to make these moves with our upper body to catch our balance, we've all been there. But when you can start to feel that instability and just think pelvis level, pelvis level, when our pelvis is level, the upper body is gonna be able to more easily align over the pelvis. And this is, um, this is also, really important for any rider that has, um, has, what's the right word, has, um, it's not misalignments, but just like differences in the symmetry, symmetry is the word I'm looking for, in our upper body. We've all got them just to different extents, but I've worked with riders, for example, that had scoliosis that they're never gonna be straight, but it doesn't matter because as long as your weight is balanced over the horse, that's what's important. So even if you're not looking straight, if your weight is balanced and you know how to find that weight balance, and our, it, that starts with the pelvis because our pelvis is 
such a big bone and actually so much of our weight that when we can align that pelvis and keep ourselves balanced there, it makes the upper body a lot easier. Okay, we have um, flown through, this hour has flown by. I wanna stay on it just another few minutes to take some of the questions. So first, we'll go to any clarifying questions here from uh, Jetty's video. Karen asks, I don't know if you've answered this question before, but what about the toes? Should they point out falling naturally in place or straight forward? Not asking about up and down. Yes, um, great question as well. This really depends on confirmation. So generally your toes are gonna to be pointing more or less straight ahead. And that gives us thigh contact on the saddle, more of the inner part of the calf instead of the back of the calf on the horse allows for what I was just talking about in terms of more freedom through the hip joints. However, I've worked with plenty of riders because again, our bodies are all different, that to have the toes perfectly straight means you would be having to use muscle to pull your toes straight. And then that completely counteracts the idea of finding the best posture. So generally toes are straight, but you wanna feel within your body of, okay, what's when I find the sensation of my foot is aligned, um, my thigh is on the saddle, Wherever your toes are pointing at that point is where they're going to point. Great question. Excellent. And then Jasna asked, my usual problem with sitting trot is as soon as I sit, my lower legs go ahead of the girth and I lose contact with the stirrups. As a result, I actually find it much easier to properly sit the trot without the stirrups. But as soon as I take them back, it happens again. Any tips on how to properly lower myself into the saddle for the sitting trot and not swing my lower legs forward? Yes, my guess is that you're probably um, you're probably doing one of two things, maybe a little of both. One is either pushing a bit against the stirrup, um, or two, and this is especially true if you notice that you lose the stirrup or if it kind of jostles free on your foot, that you might be gripping in with your thighs. Because if you're gripping in with your thighs, um, then that is going to tend to jostle your lower leg forward and make that stirrup loose. So what I would recommend doing is, um, I'm gonna kind of give you a visualization for this. So I would actually first recommend the same exercise at sitting trot in terms of think about taking your heel back and down and feel that lengthening through the back of your leg all along the length of your leg. Um, but also imagine the sitting trot, and this comes from um, my good friend and also instructor here at horse class, Angela Teletine. Um, actually, Angela was just here riding with me in Mexico this weekend. We had an awesome time. One of the things I always remember about how he so effectively taught sitting trot is he said that you jump with the horse. So a lot of times in sitting trot, we have this feeling that we've got to sit there and then we've got to absorb all this movement. And we end up having all this movement through our spine and our legs go in front where he said, think about you're on your thighs and you're jumping with the horse. One of the ways to also imagine this is if, um, if, someone is watching or if you're watching a video of yourself and there's like a line, it could be a horizon line, it could be a line of you know, wood paneling in an indoor arena, but the, as much as the horse's back is going up and down, the rider's head should be going up and down. So it's this kind of a movement instead of a lot of times if we do the sitting trot where we're doing more of this, like absorbing it in our back, not only is it worse for our back, but it also means that we're less stable and we're much less able to move to, to move with big moving horses. So that can work on a horse with a really nice little, little jog, but you have a, a big moving horse that you're sitting the trot and uh, it becomes impossible to absorb that movement. Excellent. And so a question asked, I do have short arms too. Will you be showing a video of the correct position for a person with short arms? So we, we don't have a video of this specifically in the workshop, but here's how you can find it even just right here. And this is for regardless of arm length. So our arm alignment is if you let your arms hang and you bend your elbow and you pick your hands up. I don't think I can go back far enough that you can actually see me. Um, but if your upper arm is hanging at your side. You pick your hands up and now the amount of bend in your elbow is relative to the height of the horse's um, head, head carriage, because we want to generally maintain a straight line from elbow to bit. 
Now, are there techniques where we're lifting the rein and we're doing things like that? Absolutely. But generally as kind of a, um, the base alignment, you wanna have the straight line from mid to elbow. So that's how you can find your, your best alignment. Okay, let's, I know we have so many awesome questions. This is why we are doing this two more times here together. Again, we're gonna be here again live on Thursday, same time, the link will go out for that one, the same as it did for today, also on Saturday. So let's take one more question here, and then we will see you on the next one. Excellent. So I had a few questions about injuries, so I'll finish with a question about that. Um, an anonymous question asker asks, I am recovering from a compound femur fracture that happened while I was walking alongside my horse. I felt confident with him before, but now I'm not sure I will be, feel safe with him again. How do you decide whether to continue working with the same horse after a significant injury? Yeah, this is a, this is a really, really good one. And I think this is something that um, everyone that has had an accident at some point has, you know, this has come up. So here's the kind of questions that I would that I would recommend that you that you ask yourself. The first one would be, do you feel like this is? But the first one would actually be, what is the level of risk that you're willing to take? So we all do have different levels of risk, and we have to be honest. Some horses are more riskier. You know, riding a um, so here in Mexico, I ride a young. Um, Arabian thoroughbred cross. He's five years old. He is super athletic. Um, and when he really jumps in the air, I have fallen off. He's a lot more risky to ride than the older quarter horse that's here. So it's a level of risk. I've made a conscious decision of, you know what, I'm going to take this risk and I'm going to ride this young athletic horse. And we each have a different level of risk that we're willing to accept. So that's the first of really what, you know, what is your level of risk? And there's nothing wrong with saying, it's lower now, and I'm gonna do something that is generally safer. The other thing I would ask is, you know, with the horse, is it a, um, does it feel like it is something that you can, can and want to build the skills for? So we, it's also, it's the level of risk, but then it's also the level of challenge because when we're working with difficult horses, it can just be, that's part of the journey of it is okay. Now we've got to build this whole new skill set, and we can choose to do that journey. We can also choose not to, and there's, there's nothing wrong with either one of those choices. So level of risk, um, you know, what, what do you want to be learning? What is the, the challenges and the skills that you're wanting to build? And, um, and then third, I think, you know, there, it does come down to what is your relationship with this horse? And what are your what are your goals? You know, if what you had expected to be doing together was to shift, does that feel okay to you or not? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just, um, you know, for some it, for some riders, you know, they really want to be able to go out and do those trail rides every weekend and have fun and feel confident. And for other riders, they might say, you know what, it's not going to happen with this horse, and that's fine. I'm going to take this other route with him. So I hope that helps to hope that helps to guide. Okay, thank you so much for everyone that is here. Um, thank you, York, for moderating the questions. Again, such awesome comments coming in, awesome questions. I apologize that we have not been able to get to all of them on the call, but I really hope that this was helpful. There is still opportunity to send in a video for coaching. Um, and it will probably get lost actually if we throw the link in at this point. So <laughs> look for, check your email. Um, for the link. And if you have any questions at all, um, you can reach out to us, support at horseclass.com. We are there. Catherine is our, our head of our customer support here. She does an incredible job. Um, so she's here to support you, direct you to whatever resource we have in the workshop. The very next thing we have coming up is video two is going to be released tomorrow morning. And video two tackles the myth of be the boss. And I know we've all heard this one before of this horse is disrespecting you. Um, it, you need to be a better leader. You need to show him who's boss. We're going to tackle this one and we're going to say, okay, what parts of this might have elements of truth and what parts of it are just completely old horsemanship wit, myth that is getting in the way of 
really our relationship with our horse. So thank you and I uh, hope to see you tomorrow in the comments and then see you on Thursday for our next live call.